Grace and peace to you, friends. Welcome to this time of worship together at St. Paul's United Methodist Church and Wesley Foundation. I am Greg Milinovich. I'm senior pastor here, and it's a joy for me to be able to be gathered with you in this way. As we continue in this season of Easter, we uh, continue to claim the fact that we are Easter people. We are people of the resurrection. We are people who follow Jesus. And as such, uh, the cross is one of the most important symbols of our faith. As we worship today, though, I want to invite you to think again about the cross as a symbol of our faith, as a symbol certainly of the death of Christ, of, of Christ's sacrificial love, of the way he gave himself up for us, but, but also the cross as a symbol of how it is that we live out our faith and our life day to day. That, that, in fact, our heart beats most abundantly at the intersection of divine and human love. That we meet God in the midst of other people. That we meet Jesus in the midst of the least of these. So as we worship today, I invite you to consider how might you see the cross, both as a symbol of God's bold love for you and as a symbol of your response as you are called to love your neighbor. With that image in mind, let us worship together. We are called beloved. This is a bold love, excelling all others. When we receive this love, it changes us. We love because God first loved us. This is the new commandment. This is what makes and marks us. As we are loved by Jesus, so let us love one another.
Amen. I want to invite you now to join with me as we confess our sins together in this prayer of confession. Would you uh, share in the responses as they appear on your screen? Lord, we confess our day-to-day -day failure to be truly human. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we confess that we often fail to love with all we have and are, often because we do not fully understand what loving means, often because we are afraid of risking ourselves. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we cut ourselves off from each other, and we erect barriers of division. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we confess that by silence and ill-considered word, we have built up walls of prejudice. Lord, we confess that by selfishness and lack of sympathy, we have stifled generosity and left little time for others. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Help us listen to your word of forgiveness, for we are very deaf. Come, fill this moment and free us from sin. My friends, we remember that when our hearts condemn us, we can have boldness before God because of the truth of God's amazing love for us, a sacrificial, merciful, joyful love which forgives every sin, rights every wrong, and redeems every brokenness. In the love of Jesus, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. This unthinkable mercy gives us peace, the peace of Christ, Right in the middle of our messy moments, it is this peace, a peace that passes understanding, that we offer to one another now in this moment. It's, uh, it's kind of a rainy, gloomy day outside, so I was thinking about when the boys got home from school, we might play a game or two, and I pulled out one of my all-time favorites from childhood, Shoots and Ladders, and Dumble really likes this game too, don't you? So, I don't know if any of you have this game, and I'm sh I don't even know if any of you have a game that looks like this, but for the parents out there, this is my Shoots and Ladders. It's, it's vintage and well-loved. But I wanted to take a look at the game board because I think it might be an interesting way for us to think about showing love um, and kindness in our lives. So in the game, we are trying to go up the ladders to try and get to the end of the game and win. And I noticed when I was a little bit older that all of the ladders um, are little kids showing love or, or being kind to those around them. Like this little girl, she helps her dog when it's hurt, and then she gets kisses from her dog. And then there is this um, little girl who she does some chores, and then she gets to go to the movies. Or one of my favorites is this little boy over here, he finds someone's purse and he gives it back. And then maybe the woman treats him to some ice cream. So every time in the game you get to go up a ladder, it's because the kids on the game board are doing something nice and showing kindness. Now the opposite is true for the shoots. Like this little boy, he's stealing some cookies from the cookie jar and he has to go all the way back down to the beginning because he falls and he gets hurt. Or there's um, this guy who is skating when there's a sign that says no skating, which means that ice is pretty thin and he ends up falling through and he gets all wet. Or there's this little boy who is not necessarily being kind to himself and he's kind of showboating on his bike and he falls and he breaks his arm. And then 
really bad one up here. This little boy pulls a cat's tail and then he gets all scratched up. So there's a big difference in this game from the what's happening with the little kids on the game board from when they get to go up the ladders to when they go down the chutes. And it's something that I thought that we could use when we think about showing love in our own lives and how we are kind to others. So when we think about wanting to show love or be kind, we can think about trying to find a ladder in the game to go up and to move forward because we don't want to be one of those kids that goes down the chutes and has to go back to the beginning of the game. So it's really important that we have all of this love in our hearts from God, that we show it to the people around us, whether it's our dogs, our pets, somebody we know, somebody we don't know. That is what God wants us to do. He wants us to show our love that's in our hearts and share it with everybody around us. So next time you, you have an opportunity to do that, think about this game and being able to climb a ladder and go up towards the end of the game. Okay, will you all pray with me now? Dear God, thank you for filling our hearts with so much love. There are so many people in our lives that we care about uh, and love, and then there are so many people that we may not even know that we can also show love towards. And help us to remember this fun little game we get to play sometimes with our families and how we want to climb ladders to show our love and do things that are kind for others and not go down chutes. We want to fill the world with love and keep climbing those ladders. Have a great day. Thanks for joining me. Bye. Music, and in particular, listening to music, has always been a really important part of my life. Uh, one of my favorite childhood memories is of uh, the birthday uh, when I received a radio and cassette player on which I could listen to tapes. I love that. I, I was still pretty young at this point, so some of the tapes that I had were uh, children's music. And one of my favorites that we had in our house was uh, this one called Kids Praise Album. And it featured the vocal stylings of Salty, the singing songbook, whom some of you may remember from children's productions here at St. Paul's many years ago. Salty sang songs that were fun and catchy and uh, oftentimes were sort of based in scripture. I memorized those songs and many of them remain with me to this day. One of them in particular uh, came back to me for some reason early in the pandemic and I started singing it um, around the house and then eventually singing it every night uh, with my son Quinn, my nine-year-old, as I would uh, tuck him into bed. We, we sang it every night. In fact, we still sing it almost every night together. Uh, literally taken right from the scriptures, 1 John 4, 7, and 8, which is the title of the song and which is part of our text today. And while we've added our own little twist to it, uh, Quinn and I thought you might enjoy hearing our very rough <laughs> rendition uh, of uh, our nightly ritual as uh, we consider together today what it means both to be beloved and to love one another. Let's give it a listen. One, two, three, four. Beloved, Beloved, let us love one another. Love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God. And knows God, the one who doesn't love, doesn't love, doesn't know God, because God is love. God is love. Beloved, Beloved, let us love one another. John 4, 7, and 8. Where's that? 1 John 4, 7, and 8. Okay. Love it. Love it. Love one another. Love one another. The love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God. And knows God. The one who doesn't love. Doesn't love. Doesn't know God. Because God is 
where do you find that in the Bible? First John 4, 7, Our scripture lesson continues in 1 John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent the Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and God's love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. <clears throat> God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because God first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from God is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. May God add wisdom and understanding and discernment to our hearing and responding to what God has to say for us. Thanks be to God. I absolutely love this text, which Pastor Becky has just read for us. As a preacher, what I feel when I read it and hear it is this kind of kid in a candy store feeling because there's just so much here that we can delve into. Like, I don't even know what to open first. It's so exciting. We could, we could spend months just digging into this, this small section of First John and how these ideas kind of form us and beckon us into abundant life and, and an active faith. Today, though, I am... I guess most taken by the first six words of the text. You've heard it a few times now, but those first six words are, Beloved, let us love one another. Let's take a moment to explore this seemingly simple statement. First, the author of 1 John uses the word beloved as a form of address to the, to the readers or hearers of the text. Now, whoever the original intended audience was, we don't know who exactly that was, we know that we are now the readers of these words and are, in fact, the recipients of this inheritance. And in a very real sense, then, these words become part of our story. Beloved, says First John, you are beloved. This is what we talked about last week, if you were able to, to join us for our worship last weekend. We talked about love in a bold font, that, that God's love for us is sacrificial, that it's merciful, that it's joyful. We talked about how it speaks, God's love speaks a radical truth into our lives, even when our own hearts condemn us, let alone the voices all around us. God says, 
to us in the midst of the cacophony of other voices, voices so often of, of condemnation. God says, you are my beloved. You are my very good creation. You are my love. My friends, this is something we need to hear over and over again. It's the, it's the breathing in of our spiritual life. The infilling of God's Spirit, it's, it's reminding us again and again who we are, that we are God's beloved. But we don't just hear it once and, and then we're good. <laughs> it's not how it works, unfortunately. It's an ongoing journey of remembering and rediscovering and realizing just what it means for us. So this one word, beloved, which begins our reading today in 1 John 4, 7, this one word is so rich with meaning. Like when we call each other beloved, we are claiming a radical spiritual truth. We're making quite a claim. This is not a condemning God. We don't serve a, a vindictive God. We don't worship a God who delights in punishing us or who causes terrible things to happen to us just to teach us some sort of lesson. No, we are in a relationship with a God who is relentlessly loving us. For me, part of my own spiritual journey is simply continuing to learn and relearn this, to breathe it in to let it fill me, and to, in the words of 1 John, believe. To believe that it is actually true, that God really does love me, even me, and you, and us. We are God's beloved. But that's just the first word of 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, it says, let us love one another. Let us love one another. These words form the completion of the idea that the author is, is trying to express here. Really, it's, it's the argument of the whole gospel of John and 1 John. The, the whole thesis of these writings is that you are loved by God, and so you must also love others. I mean, look at the, the Gospel of John in, in chapter 13, right after Jesus has uh, washed his disciples' feet in the upper room, and then he, he tells them that he's giving them a new commandment. Of course, the old commandment was the Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. But, but now this, this new commandment, says Jesus, the same Jesus who has just taken the, the pungent, sweat, and dirt-covered feet of the disciples and held them in his hands as he cleaned them. This new commandment, it says the kneeling Jesus, is this, that you love one another as I have loved you. All of the law Jesus said another time, can be summed up in this, in the, the greatest and second greatest commandments. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. It all boils down to this. This encapsulates all of it. For the writers of John and 1 John, then, there's no separation of these two. They are hand in hand. They are part and parcel of the same thing. They are, in fact, call and response. Now, we know about this, of course. Just this week, I was uh, taking a walk with a colleague um, through the Penn State campus and saw a group of, of prospective Penn State students and their parents walking near Old Main in, in what appeared to be a, a kind of campus tour when another group of students who were uh, reclining on the lawn, enjoying the, the beautiful spring weather, uh, all shouted out in full voice and in unison, we are, to which the prospective students and their parents responded with an equally robust Penn State. <laughs> it's a call and response that we know very well in this corner of the world, almost instinctively. We are Penn State. In a similar way, for the authors of John and 1 John, there is an almost 
instinctive, inseparable quality to the call and response of beloved, let us love. Or you might say it, you are loved, so love. As we think about this call and response, this beloved, let us love relationship, I wonder if it helps us to think about it sort of vertically and horizontally, to think about the cross, the love from God vertically, and the love for others horizontally. You hear this each week in our vision, which I, which I include in our benediction, when I remind us that we are met by God and made into faithful followers of Jesus and moved by the Holy Spirit. These are all vertical aspects of our relationship with God, who is love. But using those same three M words, meet, make, and move, we then continue by saying we should meet others and make real relationships with them, and move into new expressions of love and service. These are all horizontal aspects of our love for others. We didn't invent this, of course. This goes all the way back to these texts in the New Testament, and and really even further, if we look. It's also part of our Methodist heritage. As John Wesley, the the founder of, of this particular way of living out the faith, He was adamant about the idea that that the people who followed Christ should have lives marked by what he called acts of piety and acts of mercy. Now, acts of piety were, to Wesley, those acts that that kind of strengthen the, the vertical relationship with God. You know, prayer, worship, meditation on the scripture, fasting, holy conferencing, to name a few. But for Wesley, these acts of piety were inseparable from the acts of mercy, the horizontal acts of love toward our neighbors, things like feeding the hungry, visiting the sick and imprisoned, fighting injustice, and ending oppression and discrimination. We have a a more contemporary buzzword for some of these acts of mercy, but it's an expression that is sometimes charged with a lot of political baggage. Often today it's referred to as social justice. And for some, this has come to be a phrase associated with with some particular agenda or, or even a rejection of Christian ideals, but this is so utterly ridiculous. And, and it misses the point in really tragic ways, I'm afraid. Because what ideal is more Christian then the ideal Christ himself said is the most important, that we love God and that we love one another. Social justice are those ways we express that love to those around us, to our neighbors. It's not some new idea or some modern, you know, anti-religious humanist philosophy. Social justice is the natural outpouring of our faith. It's our fruit. Our text said as much in verses 19 and 20 that we love because God first loved us. I mean, there's that kind of call and response again, right? God loves, so we love. And then in verse 20, 1 John says, Those who say, I love God, and yet hate their sister or brother, are liars. For those who who don't love a sister or brother whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. You see, This is not some binary either-or. As Christ followers, we aren't called to choose between a steeple and soup kitchen. We need both, both the vertical and the horizontal. It's both and. It's the cross where the vertical and horizontal come together, where the cathedral and the community center intersect. That's where our faith lives. That's where the church is meant to exist. And yet, far too often, we've exaggerated the vertical, creating sort of obelisks of faith, like towers of Babel, that are impenetrable to our neighbors. But the world has often seen this and and has tried to tell us that that sometimes we're so heavenly-minded that we're no earthly good. But this is not the love that Jesus showed or the love he poured out on us. And it's certainly not the love he calls us to. This isn't the love that led him to the cross, that intersection 
of divine and human love that reaches out in every direction with its sacrificial, merciful love. My friends, the cross is our symbol. It's our call and response. It is our very identity. Beloved, let us love one another. Not in word or speech, but in truth and in action. Let us pray and protest. Let us study the scripture and serve soup. Let us fast and feed the hungry. Let us breathe in the life-giving love of God and breathe out the kingdom-building love of our neighbors. And in this, we will discover abundant life. In this intersection, in this call and response, in this cross, we will find God. Beloved, beloved, let us love one another. Amen. And now let us pray together. Gracious God, source of all life and love and goodness in abundance. Today, we reaffirm our commitment to be your people. If we are just hearing about your love for the first time, or if we're hearing about it today in a new way, or in a way that it speaks to us like never before, we want to respond by saying yes to you. We want to follow you. We want to respond to your call. We want to take up our cross and follow you and let that cross be the reminder to us that our life is multi-directional, multi-dimensional. We want this cross to fill us with love for you and for others rather than a tired symbol on our altars or steeples and, and more than a, than a gold ornament around our necks, let the cross be for us a profound reminder of your love for us and your call on us to love one another. May we live into this truth that because you love, we love. Help us to live up to our name as Christ followers, knowing your love in radical new ways and expressing it in acts of, of service and justice for our neighbors. May our love take the shape of hands reaching out, of feet walking unfamiliar roads, of hearts broken with compassion, of gifts being offered and received, of tables being shared and bread being broken. May our love take the shape of feet being washed and boundaries being broken and hope being restored. May your love become our love and our mark, our star and our vision. We pray for those who need to experience this bold love in so many different ways. And in this silent moment, we express our love by naming them out loud or in our hearts. We pray all these things in the name of the one who gave all in love for us, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray as one. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In a moment, we are going to sing together our closing song. I mentioned earlier that music has always been an important part of my life. And in fact, the song we're about to sing together was the, the first melody I ever learned to play on the guitar. I didn't know it until recently, but the tune of this song, this, this melody, is, is referred to as St. Brendan. 
named after the saint who is sometimes known as Brendan the Navigator or, or Brendan the Bold. He is remembered as a voyager who made challenging expeditions into uncertain places. As such, it feels like somebody I can really relate to in this season, sailing into some new place, an, an uncertain future. We too are traveling beyond the familiar into the unknown. As we continue in this journey, we bring our gifts with us. We offer them however we can in this new season. This week, some of you uh, have given supplies for the Neighborhood Center in Harrisburg, and uh, those gifts have been collected by our United Methodist women and will be delivered uh, for, the, for the, the center's ongoing ministry to the uh, underserved children and youth of Harrisburg. Your generosity, your gifts, continue to make a difference, even in the midst of these uncertain times. And so, let us pray together the prayer of St. Brendan as we determine to continue to give our gifts to what God is doing in us and through us so that the world may know that we are Christians by our love. Let us pray. Help us to journey beyond the familiar and into the unknown. Give us the faith to leave old ways and break fresh ground with you. Christ of the mysteries, we trust you to be stronger than each storm within us. We will trust in the darkness and know that our times, even now, are in your hand. Tune our spirit to the music of heaven and somehow, Make our obedience count for you. Amen. by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. They'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. And we'll guard human dignity and save human pride. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. All praise to the Father from whom all things come. And all praise to Christ Jesus, God's own. Son, and all praise to the Spirit who makes all us one, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. And now, friends, go as those who have been met by God in this time together who are being made into faithful followers of Jesus Christ and who are moved by the Holy Spirit. Go and meet new people and make real relationships and move out into new expressions of love and service as you take the next steps on your pathway. Go as those who, taking up the cross each day, 
are living a vertical and horizontal kind of life, your hearts and hands fully and abundantly alive in that place of intersection between God and neighbor. Go in peace. Amen.